Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us today for this news conference to uh, address the Paul Peterson plea, which occurred uh, late this morning, early this afternoon, actually at 1 o'clock. Well, 140 due to technical difficulties there. My name is Richard Pye, and I'm Director of Communications for the Utah Attorney General's Office, and I'd like to welcome all of you and uh, appreciate your adherence to the social, the social distancing guidelines. In order to address this plea, we're going to begin with uh, Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes, who's going to give an overview of the case, and then we'll get details on the plea and the case overall from uh, our Assistant Attorney General and Secure Section Director Dan Strong. Then we'll hear from our law enforcement perspective from uh, Leo Lucy, who's the chief of our investigative unit. They really did the meat of this investigation and actually led the way uh, in this state and in other states as this case was being addressed. Virtually online, we have Eldon Alec, who is the United States Consular General for the Republic of the Marshall Islands, who can address this case from uh, their point of view at the Marshall Islands. We'll have a reaction from the refugee community from Andrea Sherman, who's the director on the Traffic of Trafficking in Persons program at the Refugee Immigrant Center and the Asian Association of Utah. Also reaction from the adoption community from Dr. Uh, Jeannie Roby, uh, who is a retired BYU professor, professor of social work. Uh, Senator Luce Escamilla is, Escamilla is here, and she uh, has run legislation on this specific issue, and we'll address some of those issues as well. And we'll have final comments from our chief criminal deputy, Spencer Austin, to round it out. Now, Attorney General Reyes. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to our media partners for being here to cover this uh, press conference. Um, as Rich mentioned, today in Utah's third district court, Paul Peterson pled guilty to three counts of human smuggling and one count of communications fraud in an illegal adoption case that extended to three states and the Marshall Islands. And in fact, even more states in terms of where babies were placed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as a result, Utah today is safer, America is safer, the Marshall Islands uh, is safer. Today, justice begins to be served as Mr. Peterson will be held accountable for his crimes while his many victims are given some measure of closure in the aftermath of this tragedy. We've sent a clear message today in Utah, and that message is whether you're committing fraud, human smuggling, trafficking, or any related crimes, we will aggressively protect Utahns and come after you. I'd like to thank our extraordinary investigators, prosecutors, victim advocates, community partners, federal and state partners for their efforts, all of our legal professionals who supported this. This was truly a team effort, a lot of coordination, which you will hear about. Particularly, we'd like to thank our Attorney General of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. He's trying to join us, but I don't know if it's connected, General Hickson, but we do have Consul General Alec on there. Sir, thank you very much for your support uh, and for your uh, encouragement throughout this and all of the cooperation. Um, we'll now hear, as Rich said, from uh, one of our superstar prosecutors who is the section director of our Secure Strike Force, Assistant Attorney General Daniel Strong. And uh, I may have a remark or two at the end, but Dan, can I bring you up? And I'll oh, wait, uh, let uh, Rosie... Um, Decontaminate. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, okay so yes, Craig, and my head. Thank you. Um, as was said, uh, Mr. Peterson pled guilty this morning to four serious felonies, including human smuggling and pattern of unlawful activity. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, 
and uh, communications fraud. It was a long morning. Uh, but Mr. Peterson uh, has accepted responsibility for those serious offenses. We feel that the counts of conviction well represent the crime that occurred in Utah and in the Marshall Islands. The communications fraud perpetrated against adoptive couples here in Utah who, uh, who were misled into participating in this practice uh, that violates international law and, of course, the Marshallese birth mothers themselves who, uh, who were also uh, transported, Mr. Peter also transported here in violation of, of international law. Um, as for what's next, we haven't had a sentencing hearing yet. That's still to come. But as part of the agreement with Mr. Uh, as part of the plea agreement that we represented the court today, our office will be recommending the prison term on the second degree felony of up to 15 years. And Mr. Peterson agreed uh, that he is not allowed to oppose that recommendation. So we can feel confident that a prison term will likely be issued and we'll, of course, update everyone uh, after the sentencing hearing. Um, on that, uh, other states, as you know, Mr. Peterson faces prosecution in other states, in Arizona and in Arkansas. He pled guilty yesterday in Arizona to four felonies as well, and we expect a plea in Arkansas soon, although I, I don't want to speak for them. Those cases and the counts in those cases also carry prison terms. Um, and I want, to, I want to emphasize the cooperation among the states here. Uh, we, did, uh, we, were, we were first notified of this case by Utah residents, by medical professionals who saw what was going on, who were concerned and who called it in. Our, one of our great investigators, Mick Spilker, ran those, uh, <laughs> those leads down. And, and built the case. As it proceeded, we realized there were other investigations in other states, and we reached out to cooperate with those. And I think it's fair to say that the resolution we anticipate is a stronger one, a more substantial penalty than any state would have been able to obtain proceeding on its own. I mean, just speaking as a lawyer, uh, Mr. Peterson faced uh, over 40 felony charges in three different states. That is a tough mountain to climb, and I think that the robust effort cooperative effort on all the states accounts for why we see a conviction this early. Um, of course, one of our big concerns always has been protecting the victims uh, in this case from additional trauma, and we know that court process can be re-traumatizing for victims, and so we're, we're pleased to reach this resolution before uh, victims had to come in and testify about some really difficult issues uh, involving their families. I think that's a big benefit to the state as well. Um, we hope that the sentence is, is serious enough and that it will deter future abuses uh, by Mr. Peterson and others like him in the same business. Uh, and we hope that uh, the publicity this case has brought will educate the people of Utah and elsewhere to be on the lookout. If something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Someone's probably taking shortcuts. And I think this case has shown that, uh, that, that it's on all of us to be cautious because there are these operators out there seeking to abuse what they see as loopholes but are actually uh, committing crimes. Um, I want to thank again all the uh, witnesses, investigators, our colleagues, especially the victims who came forward and told us their stories. We could not have obtained this result without them. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, right. I want to clarify. Mr. Hickson is on the uh, left, and Eldon Alec is on the right. Can you all hear us? Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank as well the authorities in the Marshall Islands who we worked with in uh, conducting interviews and going through this investigation who educated us on the cultural issues and some of the legal issues uh, there that impacted the case. So thank you for being here, Anna. Right. And I believe we wanted to hear from uh, from uh, Consular Olick or uh, Attorney General uh, Hickson next if, if you have a minute. Thank you. Um, I'm quite the talk, uh, Eldon, or you can go ahead, I don't mind. Um, well, I, I have to uh, thank everyone that was involved in this case. Uh, we all know that it, it, it was taken a long time. But I want to also thank the, uh, some of the FBI, FBI agents here in Arkansas that uh, have really got me involved in this. But I just want to express my sincere gratitude and thankfulness to you, Utah Attorney Generals, uh, Arizona, Arkansas as well. So uh, Mr. Hickson is going to be, uh, uh, he's going to presently the statement from my government. So I'll just uh, heal to him. Mr. Hickson, please. Uh, thanks, Council General. Um, I did do a written press statement. Unfortunately, I'm really struggling with my uh, connections here, so I can't read from it, but I would like it distributed if possible. Um, Mr. Peterson has luckily pled guilty, or I'm glad Mr. Peterson has pled guilty 
uh, to these cases that involved a lot of Marshall Islands ladies um, or women who were victims of his scheme, um, basically for his own benefit, for his money. He took advantage of um, pregnant women uh, at a very vulnerable time and he, he basically smuggled them to the United States for the purpose of adoption. Uh, we have a very robust and strong judiciary in the Marshall Islands and thank you to uh, Jeannie Roby, who will apparently appear later, um, we do, who helped us with our legislation. We have a strong adoption process that is carried out in our local language and English as well. So the consents of the mothers are assured and um, that is the way to do an international adoption. It is in the Marshall Islands, in the Marshall Islands High Court, um, in the Marshallese language, where we can be sure that the consents um, are, are, are genuine and that the birth parents are aware of what's happening. Um, he's left the trail of destruction behind him, Mr Peterson has. There are a whole pile of now Marshallese women and children who are effectively stateless in the, in, uh, the United States. Um, they came for, them for an adoption that, that didn't happen. And now there's uh, a lot of people, with, a lot of ladies without families um, that are, are in uh, difficulty and it falls to the Marshall Islands to look after these people. And people like Golden have been doing a great job. And also the NGO networks in the various states have really um, helped these ladies. So I appreciate that. Um, President Kabura uh, thanks the staff of Mr. Strong's office and the other three states involved, and also thanks uh, Lamento Filippo, who worked strong, uh, effectively on the case here. This is a good indication of um, the cooperation between the Republic of the Marshall Islands and the United States. We were able to use the US Embassy here for videotape depositions, and uh, Prosecutor Strong and I have been in fairly uh, constant contact regarding progress of the matter. He's done all the legwork, but I have hopefully been able to provide him with a little a bit of advice now and again. So thank you very much. This is a very good day. Anybody um, that contemplates doing an international adoption with a Marshallese child, we welcome that. There are children here that need adoption, uh, although like any community, they're a very small number. But the, the way to do it is properly to come to the Marshall Islands, to do it through the Marshall Islands um, court system, to have your visa and immigration documents done through the US Embassy in Manila and do the adoption properly. Then everybody can be protected. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I want to acknowledge the hard work that the investigators put in on this case, particularly the lead investigator. He's camera shy and doesn't like his name thrown around, but um, he's a young man that's been around in law enforcement for a long time. This case, um, when it came up, um, I'll speak for the prosecutors here too, nobody knew what they were getting into. Uh, quite frankly, um, maybe this is a blueprint for what we're dealing with in, in society, period. Um, the investigators had to educate themselves and, and use any resources they could to understand the cultures they were dealing with, the socioeconomic environments that individuals came from, the educational systems that different individuals came from. Um, they had to study and, and learn law more than any of us investigators would like to. No offense, bosses. Um, but the laws that they were looking and, and investigating, the charges and the, the statutes and things were not familiar. So it took a lot of dedication, a lot of time. Um, the lead investigator's office began to look like an attorney's office um, very shortly. I can tell you he has dozens of binders that thick on this case. Um, and a lot of that time was spent on internet and communications with the Marshall Islands communicating with investigators in Arizona and Arkansas, as well as other states, California and other places that, that this uh, case um, touched on. Um, very proud. I know Attorney General Reyes is extremely proud of the work that was done on this case. In the end, it took the resources of, of three states and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arkansas, as well as the resources from the Marshall Islands. So it's a great example of cooperative 
law enforcement investigative and using resources effectively and efficiently. Um, great resolution. Um, disappointed that people aren't going to hear the whole story um, because it won't go to trial, but it's a, it's a very fascinating, um, disturbing, and sad story of exploitation. And it's exploitation based on religion, based on race, based on socioeconomic status, as I said, and education. Um, this individual knew how to pray on every one of those things. He had some means himself and a fair amount of education, and he used all of that to exploit these people. So I can't say enough for what the investigators and the prosecutors did on this case. Um, overcoming the language barriers and everything else that they did, it was, um, it was great to watch and, and be a little teeny um, part of. I think the, the point that needs to be made is, is, again, how exploitive this particular type of crime is. Human smuggling is, is the statute or the charge that it fell under, but it's, it's exploitation on every level from human trafficking to any other type of exploitation. Affinity fraud and everything else was used in this case. So, again, just want to state how proud we are of the investigator and the investigators that worked with him and very happy with the resolution. Thank you. on my earrings. <laughs> you just leave it there. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> dangling. Well, wonderful. We're, we're really excited that we were um, included in this, um, this press conference so that we could really um, highlight all the coordination and collaboration that they've been talking about throughout this whole process of the case. Um, um, based on our um, longstanding partnership with the Utah Attorney General's Office as a victim service partner in the Utah Trafficking in Persons Task Force. We have been able to um, assist with um, serving over 30 of the victims, Marshallese victims associated with um, the Peterson case. Um, and the Refugee and Immigrant Center has been around for 40 years helping refugee, immigrant, and victims of human trafficking in Utah. And as a multi-service um, multi-service agency, we are really able to provide a lot of supportive services um, that were accessed by um, the victims in this case. Some of those services included um, comprehensive case management um, and wraparound services, which have mental health, um, housing assistance, transportation assistance, um, after-school programs, um, employment assistance, um, really a full gamut of things um, that they were able to access um, using very qualified interpreters. We really relied on the interpreters so that we could provide that culturally specific and linguistically appropriate service that um, was really needed in this case. Um, and again, to continue with the theme of coordination and collaboration, um, we really saw a rallying of, of Utah communities behind this group. So um, when we received all of these referrals. We really turned to a lot of our community partners. Um, we worked with several members of the Republican Marshall Islands representatives. Eldon uh, came to Utah and visited, um, as long as some other consultants from, from that government. Um, we also worked with lots of community partners um, and other NGOs. And we, we just found that the, the support was just overwhelming um, to really be able to address all of the many diverse needs that, that these um, individuals have. So we're again, we're really, we're really happy to be part of this process and to be able to support the victims um, in a way that um, they can continue to receive that support, even though the case part is closing, um, that we will continue to serve the victims through our services for as, as long as is needed. So and we can you recognize you? Oh, of course. Yes, and, and our organization for the last 40 years um, has been under the, the wonderful um, stewardship of uh, Dr. Xu Cheng, um, who is also here. He's off the camera, but, um, and so really, um, he's been an advocate for that refugee and immigrant community throughout those years. So, okay. That's it. Yes. The mask. Just to tee it up, is it Dr. Roby next to you?
Good afternoon, everybody. And good afternoon, especially my friends in the Marshall Islands. <laughs> Mr. Hickson, it's good to see you again. And Mr. Alec, thank you so much for your role in all of this. Uh, I'm Jenny Roby, and I'm an um, emeritus professor of social work from BYU. And I also um, served as a, um, an attorney for abused and neglected children here in the state of Utah. And currently, I'm engaged in consulting with many developing countries, including uh, countries of origin for children who are internationally adopted and have uh, consulted with many of those governments. What I want to say in terms of why today's outcome is so important is many, for many reasons, but I will say one thing um, first, and that is that by doing this, achieving this outcome, we are showing solidarity with people whose voices really are seldom heard. And I think that's very important, and that includes even the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the national sovereignty of that country that has established a very sound and high standard uh, process of adopting children and made it very possible for people to follow a legitimate process is to be honored and to be congratulated. And yet there are people who would rather take the shortcut for their own profit. And so to me, this outcome today says we honor you, uh, the Republic of Marshall Islands, and we honor you you birth mothers and new children that are caught up in this. And I think we, we also have to recognize that many of the adoptive families are victimized by this process also. So I'm happy for that. Um, the other thing that I was so excited to hear is that we're finally connecting human smuggling and elements of human trafficking to intercountry adoption. This is something that I have dreamed of ever since the United States passed the uh, Trafficking Victims uh, Protection Act in 2000, and I thought that needs to apply to adoptions. And yet, and I have spoken at places and advocated for that, and it hasn't happened until now. And so thank you to the Attorney General and the investigative team and the prosecution team. What an amazing thing you've done. And you might think maybe that this was a multi-state effort and that's great, but I believe that this is going to reverberate throughout the global community of adoption. So congratulations, and I expect this to be repeated in other, other places as well. So um, I think that's probably all the time I have, and uh, I, I do want to acknowledge that Mr. Hickson was actually the Attorney General that <laughs> collaborated with me in setting up the uh, Marshall Islands Adoption Act of 2000. And because of his local knowledge and uh, wisdom, um, it was made possible to do that. So, Dr. Ruby, can you talk about that for one minute? The reason that you had to put that together um, is kind of a backdrop to... Yes, it actually has quite a history. Uh, beginning in about uh, the early 1990s, U.S. military families um, started to bring some of the Marshallese children home. And because of the Compact of Free Association at the time, which allows visa-free entry uh, by Marshallese citizens into the United States for purposes of, and this is the part that many people forgot about, <laughs> for education, recreation, or employment, but not for permanent immigration. Anyway, um, it was made very easy to just bring children in. And because of the lack of the local regulation at that time, uh, there were no hardly any processes. Now, um, people like uh, Mr. Hickson and other attorneys decided that they would set up some kind of a regulatory system. And then the court began to actually hear the cases but it was not necessarily mandated. And so many people left ch with children with no processing. And to this day, we don't know the count of the number of children who disappeared with no trace. Possibly, in my best estimation, seven to 800 of them. 
we don't know. And then we don't know how many have since been adopted, but there is an important point is that there is this perfectly legitimate process for one to adopt a child from the Marshall Islands. Well, after the act was enacted and implemented with the Central Adoption Authority established and trained, then people began to take the shortcut under the Compact of Free Association. And so the United States Congress actually revised the compact to, to curtail the ability to enter the United States for purposes of adoption. And this is the, the crux of this whole matter, that the visa was not obtained and that people were in fact smuggled in. And it resembles very much for, uh, human trafficking because of fraud, coercion, all these uh, important elements were included in the dynamics. So thank you. Thank you very much. I can learn to understand you much better if I can get familiar with <laughs> That wasn't me. <laughs> it's the wrong answer. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luz Escamilla. I'm a state senator representing Senate District 1. And today I'm excited and really um, it's a great moment for Utah, but also I think for the world. As explained before, I think it sends a strong message. I'm here first because um, to great collaborations with the Utah Attorney General's Office when it comes to legislation. For the last 12 years that I've been serving in the legislature in the Senate, I've run uh, multiple bills related to adoption. And part of that question is, you know, some correlation sometimes with human trafficking, which obviously this case is now setting precedent. But part of um, here in Utah, we, we love adoption. We're actually a state that prouds themselves of uh, caring for children and welcoming and, and you know, and, and processing a way where families can be built, including through adoption as a process. But we want to do it within a legal framework that makes sense and is not predatory against birthing mothers, adoptive parents, and of course, children. And part of the work I've been doing and looking forward to even getting more work done and strengthening our statutes is making sure we don't have loopholes or that gray area where you can have people uh, that practice horrendous things and take advantage of people. So I, um, two sessions ago we passed a bill which at one point there was conversation of from the initial part of the bill to where we end up with a bill could have been a more stronger um, uh, pieces on the statute to even bring, uh, you know, stronger accountability to those type of actions. So I'm looking forward to working again with the AG's office in collaboration to get to the point where our statute truly reflects who we are as a state. We will not tolerate human trafficking. We're not gonna tolerate any more abuse against uh, birthing mothers that are maybe in a situation that are vulnerable and puts them in a place uh, and makes them uh, make decisions or sign papers without understanding what they're signing. We're seeing a lot of those pieces coming up um, especially on communities such as refugee and immigrant communities. We still see more of that. And then also the ability to protect those uh, adoptive parents that are obviously putting their heart and financial you know, pieces into their process. And then the children, which I think is probably the most important piece of this conversation, is this, these are babies we're talking about. Uh, these are not a product or a service. It's a child. It's a human life. And we certainly in Utah protect that. So I'm excited for the ability to continue working and tackling some of the cultural and linguistic intelligence that was mentioned before. How do we address this in a systemic way that truly uh, becomes respectful to people's uh, cultures uh, as we interact in a, in a global uh, process? And I, I love of this, the historical piece that was explained by our, the good professor. Uh, it was like being a little bit of a lecture for two minutes, and, but it really puts um, everything in perspective going back to that 2000 you know, act of, um, in Congress, and then statutes within our state that have really put forward proactive approaches. And I'm, at this point, it was part of our conversation a year ago of considering a compact within states where this, you know, we saw this with Arizona clearly and other states where you can now have interstate compacts really 
proactively be aggressive in stopping this. So I'm very excited and thank you again to also our, our partners and friends in the other parts of the world that are also helping us make this happen. So thank you again. Oh yes, Spencer, Spencer, Spencer uh, our chief criminal deputy is going to wrap it up and then we'll, we'll take questions. And we have a number of people that are also watching uh, online. And so I'll relay some questions from them as well, just so that you know we've got other people monitoring this. Okay, very briefly. Uh, my name is Spence Austin. I'm the chief criminal deputy in the Utah Attorney General's office. We've all heard a lot about a very large team that's been involved in all of this, but with all teams, there is a leader. And that leader is the Attorney General of the State of Utah, Sean Reyes. When I brought this matter to him a couple of years ago, it was one of those that, wow, how many resources, how much time are we going to spend? And it was a lot, far more than we would spend on most cases. But it was worth it. And with that, with meetings that we had every week that people didn't like, but I forced on everybody. We got it done finally after about two years, and we have the pleas, and hopefully we will have pleas in Arkansas next week. So with that, when the Attorney General came into office in 2014, one of his signature programs was human trafficking, human smuggling. And he has lived up to that, and we are chasing those folks now. So thank you, Sean, for all that you've done for us and for the state of Utah. And the word is to anybody who's going to come into the state of Utah with regard to human smuggling or human trafficking, we're coming after you. These are new terms. Yeah. While she's wiping down, let me let me just take advantage of a a moment again to thank our international partners. Uh, but also, I hope you got a little bit of a flavor, and they'll be available for interviews afterwards. The, the incredible superstar that Dr. Roby is. She is a leader in her field, and I can't think of a better diplomat and advocate for protecting children, particularly in adoption. Than her. So I hope you'll take some time to interview her and talk to her. Thank you to our partners again, Andrea, Shu. You guys are always there for us. What you might not be aware of, because they don't tout themselves, is that the Department of Justice believes so much in them that they give them an annual grant to be able to continue their programs that help victims throughout the entire state of Utah. So they're, they're, they're not just human trafficking. They're doing um, victim advocacy and support um, in all sorts of different crimes. And then I, I also wanted to thank Luce for being here, Senator Escamilla. She has been such a champion for us in the legislature on these types of issues. She mentioned just a couple that we're working on, but I wanted to highlight one, others, uh, one other type of case that, that is not this case, but is, is related, and that's the unauthorized transfer of custody cases that Senator Escamilla helped us pass the first state in the United States to pass laws to forbid people from being able to just put their child up for adoption online. And we understand that, uh, that adoptions can be very difficult and that many uh, adopting parents of goodwill don't realize and understand the trauma and the even torture that many of the kids they're adopting have experienced and suffered, especially when the adoptions are coming from overseas. But what we sent together by passing law in Utah is a message that we'll help you get the resources you need or we will help you in a secondary adoption program. Find and place with a family that is perhaps better equipped or willing to take on those challenges, but we will not tolerate somebody putting up on back page an ad that says, like, used furniture, come get a child. And because we know a lot of those people who were exploiting that uh, loophole were predators, uh, traffickers. And so I just want to, again, thank you, Senator Escamilla, for your, for your support, for being here and, and what we're doing. And we will now open up uh, for questions. Um, any of our uh, presenters, uh, Dan Strong, will have probably the most information on the case uh, Chief Lucy on the investigations, but we're uh, we're open and we'll be available afterwards. Um, to any any other final thoughts or comments that that we've that we've overlooked, uh, you guys. Thank you for the to the media also. Uh, Rich, you want to um, yeah. take case or questions uh, online? Does or? anyone have any questions that they'd like to like to ask? Um, why don't you go ahead? And do you know 
Yes. Who you'd like to speak to? Probably Dan. Yeah, this is probably for Dan. Um, I wondered if you could discuss kind of the legal loopholes that Mr. Peterson was using, as well as I know someone mentioned it was over about 30 women. If you could kind of tighten that up and tell me how many victims we're talking about here and kind of how you guys. I can learn to understand you much better if I can get familiar with the. Sorry. Just that for answer our question is probably. <laughs> Um, yeah, nice shortcut. And then I do have a question about the charges dismissed today, and I'll ask you that in a minute. Can you do it in March release? Okay. <laughs> I just want to clarify, too. The case is not over. We have a sentencing hearing still to come, and that does limit some of what I'm available able to say at this time. Um, I can talk about uh, things that are public record, and, and you all have the charging documents, which, which should have the answers to these questions in them, and I'll do my best to summarize, but I don't want to speak beyond those. Um, you know, even though there's a lot that went into this case that, that you know, you know, when it's all over, we can probably talk more. But um, so the question was uh, the, the loophole. And I guess I would push back on that, that, that we don't believe there is any loophole here. That as, as Dr. Roby explained, um, the, Marshall, the, the compact with the Marshall Islands clearly says uh, that it, it's, it's um, the visa-free travel or to the United States is outside of the compact if it's for purposes of adoption, which means you need a visa to do it. And so bringing someone here without a visa uh, is human smuggling if you do it for, for financial gain under our human smuggling statute. So, um, again, we, we think that's a clear-cut crime. I'd use the word loophole earlier to refer to what I believe Peterson's argument would be, that he, that he doesn't think this compact is enforceable in some way, but obviously we disagree, and that's why we charge the case. Have you guys traced this case? Dan, can I add to that? Yeah, Richard, please go ahead. Uh, what Peterson was doing was um, bringing in pregnant women, so they weren't... Uh, noticed by the authorities um, because an adult obviously came into the Republic and uh, into the United States and the suspicion that she's coming from an adult and is not raised as opposed to a number of women with young children. So um, it wasn't a loophole, um, but he was taking advantage of just the practical purpose of bringing pregnant women rather than women and children. Thank you. Um, how many? Oh. Yeah, and this is in the charging document as well under count one pattern of unlawful activity. Uh, the number we we had at that time at least was over 40 uh, Marshallese women who were transported here and subsequently placed their babies for adoption um, after uh, residing in a residence linked to Paul Peterson. That was our, what we found. Has Peterson's case opened up? almost like a can of worms of other cases that are connected to this, um, connected to human smuggling, connected to um, communications fraud, anything like that? I would say, you know, I, I can't speak to ongoing investigations, and they may be happening other places. Um, we believe Peterson was the, the biggest operator of anything like this in Utah, and that's where our focus was. There's... Art, I'd recommend you, you check out the uh, Honolulu uh, Civil Beat, I think it's called. There's a newspaper that's done a lot of coverage on this issue in particular, and they did, they did mention in their coverage um, other operators who had similar schemes. But And Richard, you, could, you probably would know better than I do, but I, we believe Peterson was one of the largest operators. Um, yes, thanks, Dan. Uh, yes, from this end, uh, we are trying to close down. Uh, we've done some local prosecutions for um, people who are facilitating it from this end. Um, Peterson seems to have been the biggest player in this. There is uh, accusations against a uh, Hawaii uh, attorney and um, a Hawaii group. That's also being investigated by the Attorney General of Hawaii and the person, I believe, has been disbarred from practice. Um, so there's not a can of worms out there, but there have been other operations that uh, we've been able to close down. Um, obviously, there's no travel at the moment, so there's no... Uh, no, um, well, well, there is, I don't know if it's obvious, but there is no travel from the Marshall Islands at the moment, so um, uh, it's not a problem at the moment, and we've uh, got fairly rigorous uh, processes to ensure against it now. General Hickson, is that correct? Do you mind? No, it's not General. I, that was a joke I made to Dan, and the, the general mm -hmm. term is stuck, but it's Attorney General. But, um, <laughs> Attorney General. You can't make a joke like that with the media in the room. <laughs> I wondered if you could go more into that. You briefly touched on it, kind of the effect and impact this has had on the Marshall Islands and the women there. Uh, go into that a little bit more, um, how it's impacted you guys. I don't even know if you have seen this in numbers um, affecting commerce or anything like that. Do you mind sharing what type of impact this has had on your guys' islands? 
the the obvious impact is there are forty now at least forty women in the in the United States, um, and I don't want to get into the argument about their, their immigration situation, but they're in the United States with a baby, um, possibly with no support. They they have it from the victim support, and we appreciate that greatly. But they went there with under mis misguided apprehension that um, they were going to be supported and looked after and. Uh, they are there without that. So there's the obvious effect of the of the victims. Um, in terms of locally, it's just uh, re refocused us on um, the avenues we need to pursue to to investigate future adoptions. We have, as I say, and we've we've again done another public information campaign, quite a rigorous one, um, advising people that if they are um, in the adoption um, situation that they have children that they can't care for or there are children that are um, better off being adopted, that there is a legal process to do it and we put them in contact with the uh, Central Adoption Agency and the, the, um, the law firms. Um, but uh, of course at the moment um, with the travel ban uh, there is no adoptions really occurring. But when, once the uh, borders open up then um, the adoptions will occur again. The whole idea is that the American parents or the adopting parents, not just Americans, come to the Marshall Islands. It's processed in them. So they know where the child comes from. They know the child's background. They meet the family. Um, it's processed in Marshallese and English in the High Court. The mother's got an opportunity to re uh, renege on her consent uh, for 30 days and, uh, and um, she understands exactly what's going on and there's no chance that um, People smuggling occurs under our system that uh, was was prepared uh, in assistance with. Uh, funnily enough, my friend Jeannie Roby, uh, we did it uh, 20 years ago. Anyone else? So I have a couple of uh, virtual questions, Dan, um, okay. and uh, Attorney General Reyes. Uh, one of them that comes from the Associated Press asking about the uh, sentencing, just kind of clarifying how Utah's sentence interfaces with the federal term that he'll spend in Arkansas and what he'll see in Arizona. Could you just sort of clarify what, how, how that's all intermingled? Uh, yeah, I'll do my best with the caveat that uh, that, that remains to be seen. And, uh, and you know, the purpose of this is not to, uh, of this announcement is not to um, try to, advocate for something that we'll have to do in the court process later. Um, but I can tell you that the, uh, well, I can tell you, my understanding from what I listened to in the Arizona hearing yesterday was that he faces between three and 12 and a half years in prison on their lead charge. Our count, it's up to 15 years. And in Arizona, in Arkansas, he faces charges, he hasn't pled yet, but faces charges that carry a maximum of 10 years. Um, I know that their counsel is seeking uh, that all those sentences was run at the same time. And uh, one of the benefits of this case, as I mentioned earlier, is that because we all proceeded together, you know, we were able to um, put a lot of pressure on the defense and get a, a resolution quickly that we feel account, accounts for the crime. Um, but that also means that likely the prison sentences will run at the same time rather than being stacked on top of each other. So, you know, so somewhere between three to 15 years total is our understanding of what, of what will likely happen. And then uh, we have a question from the Deseret News who's watching online. Uh, how many of the, do we know how many of the Marshallese adoptions actually went through uh, where the mothers are now? And uh, if there were any Utah parents who ended up not being able to adopt children because of the case that you were pursuing? That, uh, I'd have to refer you to, uh, to you know, kind of, there's just so much that goes into that with every situation is a little bit different and I, would, I don't want to speak for anybody. The, I can tell you the, the, um, couple, the people we worked with on this case, the witnesses and victims who were prepared to testify, both from the adoptive couples side and the Marshallese birth mother side, um, were, uh, were compassionate towards each other and uh, had relationships and, you know, the children were known to each side of the equation and we felt comfortable um, with the way those relationships were. Um, I'm, I don't know if there are other abuses out there. Um, I don't know if there are, uh, at, at present, uh, unresolved situations. Um, I don't want to speak to all that, and maybe General Hickson would know better than I do. But part of the problem 
with this scheme is that it does create all this uncertainty and, and anguish for uh, people on both sides of the equation. Um, and, and I think it's only because of the compassion of those adoptive couples and their families in trying to bridge that gap that they didn't create um, that we felt that, that these situations were, were somewhat stabilized. Um, and obviously, you know, we're criminal prosecutors. We go after the crime. There's a lot that goes into this that, that I don't have any expertise Again, in. But, our understanding yeah. is not all of the adoptions that were intended to go through actually finalized and went through. Yeah, well, I, obviously, when we filed the case, there was a substantial interruption. And, <laughs> um, you know, there's been a lot after that that I, I don't want to go into because I'm not involved in those decisions. Do you have anything, Andrew? How many adopted families were there? We talked about the women, but how many? families were impacted here in Utah? Well, our charges were, um, I mean, there are many, many families who adopted through Paul Peterson. Uh, our investigation found that. Uh, we had uh, uh, three counts, I believe, of uh, communications fraud, which those are three couples we work with directly. Um, we heard from many others, but, you know, we try to target our best counts when we file the, these and, and not try to involve more people than need to be involved in the criminal prosecution. Andrew might have some background. Oh, yeah, thank you. Back yes, back I'm just taking all the time. Thank you. Um, so in reference to, uh, I guess, first clarification, so um, our agency specifically worked with 30 victims that were associated with the case. So there were other victims who did return to the Marshall Islands um, over the course of, because the 40 is over the course of several years. And so some returned, um, some did not reach out for services um, because they had other supports in place. Um, so the 30 is part of that larger group. And we serve people um, the two big pockets of people were really up in the Logan area and then um, in Salt Lake and Davis County. And so um, th we have some victims, outliers in other areas of Utah, but those are where we saw the, the largest concentration. Um, and just to the question of, we, we did um, specifically within our um, stewardship have um, mothers who decided to continue with the adoption and mothers who decided to, to stop the adoption. So. Um, the mothers who did continue with the adoptions um, really were um, with the with the additional supports in place that just like they would receive in the high court in the Marshall Islands, that they were um, connected with um, attorneys, so they would have their own representation within the adoption. They would have adoption advocates who would be there to explain the process, to explain um, all of the many things that were that were not provided um, through Peterson's. Um, process and so um, and then all of that done with a with a qualified interpreter so they were getting the, getting the information to be able to make informed decisions um, and then supported by advocates through our agency to make a decision that was that was yeah within uh, what they what they felt would happen with the case so. yeah. well, ladies and gentlemen I think uh, you want to yeah. I believe those were all of the online questions that we had. Um, again, just to emphasize a point that Chief Austin made, our office handles all kinds of cases re regarding exploitation and some of the most uh, egregious crimes that are committed in our state. But we as a team in the AG's office can't think of a more heinous crime than stealing children or selling children and that's why we put so much effort and so many resources, and we're so glad to have the support of legislators, community partners, and um, friends in academia and all around, because it really takes our community coming together to raise awareness about these issues and then saying, we will not tolerate this, we won't let this happen uh, in our backyard, in our state. So again, thank you all so much for being here, and I think that wraps us. Rich, we're good. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good day. Stay safe out there.